All right, so we've gone almost a day and we haven't said too much about housing. There was a time not just a few years ago when even a, even a conference focused quite a bit on commercial. We obviously spent quite a time talking about subprime housing, et cetera. Our, our next speaker is going to turn our attention back uh, toward that. His name is John Duca. John is the Associate Director and Vice President of Research at the Federal Reserve Bank at Dallas. And what John does out there is he supervises and conducts research in macroeconomics uh, in finance. So prior to joining the Fed in Dallas, uh, he spent a couple years at the, at the board uh, in, in Washington, D.C., where he had the privilege to uh, brief uh, former Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan a number of times, as well as, well as former Fed Chairman uh, Paul Volcker. Uh, he graduated summa cum laude from Yale University uh, with a degree in economics and then got his PhD in economics uh, from Princeton uh, University. So um, I know John quite well from his work uh, on housing. Uh, I've seen him around the country, around the world. Um, he has published over 80 uh, peer-reviewed academic articles, uh, works in housing, uh, in, in wages, uh, macroprudential, uh, and of course being at the Fed uh, is up close and personal to a lot of the stuff that was going on uh, then. Um, and as I just said, um, he and some of his co-authors have written some fairly influential work on the housing market, subprime crisis, uh, boom and bust, uh, and I'm anxious to see what his comments are today. So John, thanks for coming. Well, thank you, David. And uh, it, this is a great privilege and honor to be here today. Uh, the Berg, I appreciate the Bergstrom Center for uh, inviting me to be part of this event. And I'd like to thank Tim Becker and Wayne Archer, as well as David, for having me here. Today, I'm going to share some comments on making sense of the housing recovery. Uh, before I begin, of course, I've got to give the typical Fed disclaimer that everything I say is my own opinion and not necessarily that of the Federal Reserve. I need to say that, otherwise I could be a statistic in next month's unemployment report. And the TSA may take me to one of those back rooms when I try to fly back to Dallas. The other thing that's really nice is uh, the rest of the country is uh, experiencing, uh, with the exception of the West Coast, is experiencing a lot of ice and snow. And uh, it is very nice to be here in Florida. A lot of what I'm going to say today is based on a number of articles that I've uh, written over the years. Many of them are available online. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is based on the annual report of the Dallas Federal Reserve that was published in uh, the spring of 2014. Uh, these articles were written over a number of years, but I want to point out one thing. I'm, I'm not a Johnny-come-lately, and I'm not a Monday morning quarterback. If you look at the very bottom, uh, I was warning, I was writing stuff about warning, warning of overvaluation in housing in 2004. Actually, a lot of that was written in 2003. So I've been very concerned about overvaluation and, and booms and busts, uh, and I think uh, my comments today will reflect it. Well, no matter how you slice or dice it, we've seen a large run-up and decline in house prices. Here are two, uh, two of the main indices, and here you see rises of home prices of 67 to 100 percent during the boom phase, a dec declines of 20 to 30 percent during the bust, and some rebound. And whether you look at house prices or house price to rent ratios or house prices relative to income, you get the same story. This was an unprecedented boom and bust in U.S. house prices. And of course, one of the things that happens when existing house prices rise relative to replacement costs is that it spurs a surge in construction and indeed an overbuilding of housing. This is a chart of single family permits that's in blood red. And the blue line is the dollar volume of all single family construction plus home improvements. A few things I'd like to point out in this chart. Prior to 2000, you could explain all the wiggles in housing construction and house prices with two key variables, income or jobs, and interest rates. It was an era of stable credit standards in the background. 
Basically, we, you could get an FHA loan for a starter, small size mortgage, or you could get a prime mortgage where you either had to put 20% down at a minimum or some combination of a down payment and private mortgage insurance that provided a 20% cushion. Those private mortgage insurers basically gave exceptions to the down payment constraints that we typically used to think about that our parents faced with the proviso that you had some other factors that made it viable. That was a stable era. You'll notice when we look at the 2000s that construction soars. Now, in general, okay, you had these cycles, but they were rate cycles, they were short-lived. The Fed would let interest rates, would keep interest rates low, inflation would pick up, jobs would be surging, housing markets would be surging, then inflation would get out of hand and the Fed would do what? It would jack up interest rates, and that's certainly gonna hurt housing demand, and it would also hurt jobs, and both things would go down. And you got this sort of cycle going on. But things changed a lot when you look towards this, this part of the diagram. We had the high-tech bust in 2000. It was a collapse in business investment. The Fed didn't in increase interest rates during the 2000 recession. It cut them. So what did we have? We had jobs and incomes going down during the recession. But we also had interest rates falling. And one factor pushes down housing demand and house prices, the other pu pushes it up. And what's the net? We had a recession without a decline in housing in 2000, 2001. What happened in this era was the, and I'm gonna show you some data in a little bit, talking about how there was a relaxation of credit standards that basically expanded the effective demand for housing. Down payment constraints were essentially eliminated during the subprime boom. House prices soared, and that induced a massive increase in home construction. Normally, we need about one million units a year to replace homes that get demolished and to deal with the underlying growth rate in the population. During the subprime boom era, we produced way too many houses, and the only way that that could be sustainable was if there were a permanent rise in the home ownership rate. We saw the home ownership rate rise from about 65% to 69% in a five-year period. The problem was that that rise in home ownership was not sustainable because the credit conditions underlying that were not sustainable. Every time I look at this chart, I picture the cartoon character, Wile E. Coyote. He's got an Acme subprime rocket strapped to his back. He goes way up. He thinks he's a super genius. But there are a lot of unintended consequences. House prices are rising during the early part of the subprime boom. So if a subprime borrower got into trouble, what did he or she do? They could sell their house at a higher price and pay off the loan. The loan looks good. Or they could get a home equity line, or do a cash out refinancing, and the loan still looks good. But when the house prices stop rising and a non-prime borrower gets into trouble, the loan losses show up. And when they showed up, people realized that the investment grade ratings on a lot of these private label mortgage-backed securities that were funding much of this subprime stuff, were not invest these were not investment grade. A lot of them were downgraded to junk. These were not government guaranteed. The funding dried up, and Wiley Coyote fell off a cliff. Comes all the way down, hits the bottom. We have a little bit of a tax credit. He's popping back up, but then the proverbial rock hits him on the head, and back down he goes. We have since, uh, so we had this collapse, a 75% decline in construction the worst we have seen since we've had monthly statistics on housing starts going back to the uh, early 1960s. If you look at the annual data, the collapse in construction was the worst we've seen since the Great Depression or, or World, War, uh, World War II period where, when there was a lot of rationing. We overbuild houses. The homeownership rate goes back from 69% back to 60, 65%. 
And we go through a period where we have below normal construction. Why? Because we have, an over, we have a glut of houses. We have to sell these things off. The good news is the inventories have uh, been largely worked off, and we are in a recovery phase. It's sluggish, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Now, let me uh, talk a little bit about credit standards and why um, I, I, I tend to subscribe to the following view, that there was an unsustainable easing of credit standards that fueled a run-up in housing demand so credit standards were eased. That boosts housing demand. House pr this induces a rise in house prices. And it makes the mortgage rate adjusted for house price appreciation look low. That induces a further rise in housing demand. So the credit standards get eased. The effect gets multiplied by past appreciation affecting house price expectations the real user cost of capital plunges. That further induces people to buy. And these are the dynamics that get us into this mess. Let's take a look at some data here. Now, many people, the first thing they were doing in the early 2000s and mid-2000s was they would look at the down payment ratios or the loan-to-value ratios from Freddie and Fannie. But they were reporting the loan-to-value ratios on prime mortgages. What's going on during this period is there was a lot of subprime lending. Non-prime mortgage originations went from about 8, 9, 10 percent in the early 2000s to nearly 40 percent, two in five homes, in 2006. So those loan-to-value ratios were off the proverbial radar screen. So what did my co-authors and I do? We went into the bowels of the American Housing Survey and looked at the credit standards, the loan-to-value ratios that first-time home buyers were, were paying. And this is, this is important because it's the marginal buyer. If one existing home owner buys a house from another existing home owner, they swap houses, overall housing demand really doesn't change. It's the marginal buyer, the people who are entering the market that matter. And so what we did was we, we looked we constructed a series, a time series going back to the late 1970s on the loan-to-value ratios for first-time buyers. And the series looks very, very different. What do we see? We see a period of relative flatness. We get a sharp decline in loan-to-value ratios during the SNL mess when they were actually shutting down the SNLs and Basel I capital standards were about to be, be imposed. And then we adjust and they recover. You see a ramping up here. And this is, by the way, for private mortgages. This excludes FHA and VA mortgages. And then you see, so this chart implies we had about a 15 to 12% down payment ratio back here. As the loan to value ratio rises, the down payments are becoming less onerous. And then they nearly disappear during the subprime boom. The loans go bad, the funding dries up, and down we go. But that's not the whole story, because a lot of first-time buyers use FHA mortgages. So if we fold in FHA, uh, that's, uh, sh this is all the LTV ratios in all types of mortgages, and that's in blood red. What do we see? We see the ratio is going to be higher. Well, of course, lo FHA loans have a lower down payment. Um, they this, whole, this holistic picture also rises, but you see the lines diverge during, after two, late 2007. Why? Before 2007, the average size on a, the maximum size on an FHA mortgage was roughly speaking 35% of that on a, on a loan, a mortgage that, that Fannie or Freddie would, would buy and package as a conventional mortgage. The bottom, dry, the bottom falls out in financing, and what does FHA do? They expand the, the maximum size of FHA loans from 35% all the way up to 100% of the size, the maximum size on a, on a GSE um, mortgage. And what happens? FHA share goes from very low single digits to nearly 30 40%. And what happens is we still see a fallback in the loan-to-value ratios. So a rise in the LTV reflects 
Falling down payments and easing of credit standards, the degree to which we fall back reflects a subsequent tightening. When you, fall, when you use the red line in house price models, you can pretty much explain what happened to house prices, and that's what my co-authors and I have done. Now, what happened here? Why did this occur? A couple things. Well, I mentioned the savings and loan bailout, but in the early 1990s, the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, had their housing home ownership and housing affordability goals raised. Fannie and Freddie did not really package, did not buy and a lot of subprime, whole subprime loans and then package them into mortgage-backed securities. They bought those private label mortgage-backed securities and indirectly funded the market that way. And when they did in the early, to early 1990s, you saw some rise in the LTV ratio. Things got even hairier when you look at the mid-2000s. Several things coalesced at the same time. The housing goals were raised, so Fannie and Freddie bought more of this stuff. But I think the key things that happened were that the capital requirements on subprime mortgages were effectively cut, and cut a lot. And what, what basically happened? In the mid-2004, mid the Basel capital requirement on a mortgage-backed security that was double A, or that was investment grade rated, was cut and cut dramatically. If it was double A AA or triple A rated, you had a 20% capital weight, which basically meant a commercial bank could buy a subprime mortgage-backed security, backing subprime mortgages, and all they had to hold in capital was 1.6%. The capital requirement on a CNI loan, a commercial and industrial loan, was 8%. So the capital standard got cut a lot. And what did, the, what did the banks do? They bought a lot of this stuff. But the investment banks also had their leverage requirements, their leverage requirements effectively lowered by the, an SEC ruling in mid-2004. So they levered up. And if you look at the big five, what used to be the big five investment banks, the first two that went under, Bear and Lehman, were issuing a lot of short-term debt to basically buy a lot of subprime mortgages, private equity, and God knows what. And basically, they took big, big losses, and they were the first to go under. So the investment banks and the commercial banks, there was a lot of easing of the regulatory requirements on holding these subprime mortgage-backed securities, which funded virtually all of the non-prime uh, lending that was going on at the time. S combination of regulations, and this was also the era of structured finance, when structured finance took off. We end up getting a lot of funding. A wall of finance enters the uh, subprime market. We get a lot of subprime lending. Credit standards get eased, but they're unsustainable. A lot of times in capitalism, what happens in financial panics is that during good times, a new instrument is introduced. In this, in in this case, it's a structured finance-funded subprime mortgage. It's not really stress-tested until Bad things happen. You increase leverage in the system. Well, the regulators allow allowed that to some extent. And innovation also enabled that. And a lot of bets were made. And unfortunately, they, they failed. And, when they, and this experiment failed. And we, we, we've had a serious problem. Now, where do we go from here? That's the backdrop. What, how can we make sense of current and future housing conditions? One natural question is, is the national housing recovery for real? And I would say the affordability, price, and inventory patterns imply yes. I'll show you some data on that. But the credit standards and incomes are not fully back, and I'm going to talk about that as well. We all hear the old mantra, location, location, location. What accounts for regional patterns? There are obviously differences across the regions in housing supply and labor market conditions, and they have a lot to do with why we see uh, the patterns we do, and I'll review some of that. And of course, the natural question is, what's next? We're likely to see a continued recovery in housing. The pace is going to depend a lot, not only on mortgage rates and job growth, but more deeply on also on what's happening with regulation, what happens with mortgage 
credit standards, and living arrangements are also changing. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. We're not likely to go back to 69%, the 69% home ownership rates that we saw in 2007, 2008. I think we're probably going to see something more akin to what we saw in the early 1990s. So let's, uh, let's first look at this question. Is the national recovery for real? If we look at prices and construction, the, the series, you know, you saw the recovery in house prices. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's take a look at inventories. And those two signal recovery. What about valuation measures? Well, house prices seem to be in line with rents, past appreciation, interest rates, and income. And we're also seeing loan quality return back towards more normal rates. Let's first take a look at inventories. Here I have the inverted month supply of existing home, homes. How long, how many months does it take to sell all the houses that are listed at the current sales pace? It's inverted. So for example, uh, during the bottom that you see here, the month supply at the national level was nearly 10 months. That is well above the six-month rule of thumb that we are, we're all familiar with. I inverted it because I'm going to show you house price appreciation adjusted for inflation in just a second. So when you're above, below this line, sorry, you have excess supply. When you're above the line, inventories are low. You have demand high relative to supply. The blue line is the what has happened to house price appreciation using the FHA, FHFA uh, index adjusted for inflation. Well, when inventories are low, we have sizable ap appreciation above and beyond inflation. When we have inventories that are low, uh, inventories that are high and the inventory uh, index here plunges, we get the reverse. Where are we? We actually have tight supplies nationwide. And that varies a little bit by index. So the house price appreciation we see is in line with inventory uh, positions. And you also see the long house price boom that we had, years of very strong appreciation. What about valuation measures? Classic valuation measure is the price to rent ratio, which is akin to a PE ratio on stocks. Virtually all of these swings we see before the 2000s, you could explain with using mortgage interest rates, adjusting for taxes, and adjusting for past appreciation on, on house prices. This big run-up you see is due to, was kicked off by the easing of credit standards that I was mentioning to you before. The collapse is the, re is the return towards normal. If you, if you control for credit standards, if you look at interest rates, the little, the little rise we see towards the end over here is in line with more, where mortgage rates are right now. So the valuation measure, this is not a bubble in house prices. Some people worry about that, but I, I don't think we see that right now. What's another valuation measure? The debt service burden. This is the housing opportunity index that's produced by Wells Fargo and the National Association of Home Builders. What is it? It is the percent of homes sold in a given quarter that is affordable to the median income American household. What does affordability mean here? They put 10% down. They're borrowing at the prime mortgage rate, and they're not spending more than 28% of their gross monthly income on mortgage payments. This is the akin to the old rule that our parents used to use. And what does it show? Generally, this ratio stays around the low 60s in normal times. It plunges during the great housing boom. What happened? House prices are rising so rapidly that they're rising relative to incomes and mortgage payments are rising relative to income for people to buy that. Affordability suffers tremendously. Then we get this massive reversal. What's going on there? House prices are plunging. 
Mortgage interest rates are also plunging. Affordability surges for those who could qualify for a mortgage and those who had the guts to buy houses in, let's say, 2010, 2011, 2012. The index has, uh, unfortunately, the, the uh, curtain's in my way. The index has come back towards a more normal range between 60 and 70 in recent years. What does that reflect? It mainly reflects that house prices have, have recovered some. And affordability has sagged, but it's back into a normal range. So whether you look at valuations from a price to rent ratio, ratio approach, a PE approach, or from a debt service approach, things look okay. What about loan quality? The line in red, blood red, is the percent of subprime mortgages that are entering the process of foreclosure. They surge during the boom, but they have come back down towards more pre-recessionary levels. But more importantly is what's happening with the overall or the prime mortgage foreclosure rate, that's in blue. It surges during this period. And you may ask, how is it that prime mortgage foreclosures surge? Well, uh, let, let me offer you a, 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 my own view of housing markets. Housing, I think, is an illiquid asset. When you look at house price indexes, what do they reflect? That five, normally we have 5% turnover in established residential neighborhoods. 5% of the people want to buy homes in your neighborhood, reflecting people who are relocating into your neighborhood and young people who are moving up from being renters to owners. Who are they buying from? 5% of the population in your neighborhood who are either retiring or who are relocating out. That's the normal equilibrium. But when you have a massive cut in credit standards, you could have an extra 1% or 2% of the population now entering the housing market. It doesn't sound like a lot, but look at the thin trading. Instead of 5% of the population chasing 5% of the houses, you have 7% or 6%. You have more demand than supply. It bids up house prices. So when the subprimers enter the market, they push prices way up. If you, are, if you bought a home in California with a 20% down payment, let's say in the LA uh, area in 2007, you were underwater three years later. The down payment simply could not fully absorb the collapse in prices. And that's part of the reason we saw conventional or prime mortgage foreclosures rise. But the good news is they're back to pre-recession levels. Now let's ask about regions. Things differ a lot across the country. And in particular, supply sensitivity matter, or supply elasticities matter a whole lot. And you can illustrate this by looking at the Northeast versus the South and look at what's happening with house price indicators about metro areas. What do we see when we look at construction patterns. These are single family permits in the south that's in green and the northeast which is in blue. Obviously construction moves around a lot more in the south. So when demand picks up, we generally allow more construction that mutes the increase in house prices. In the northeast where it's a lot tougher because A, you built up the areas along the coast there isn't much you can do about building into the sea and you've got tougher zoning restrictions, you're not going to get that supply response. What does that result in? It results in prices moving a lot more in the Northeast than they do, let's say, in the South. And here I'm looking at uh, census division uh, measures. What about metro areas? There are metro areas where you can build very readily and those where you can't. There are 19 major metropolitan areas in the United States where we have rent data back to 1983. Two of those, uh, the data are, in, are, are, they have sample breaks, but I took 17 of those cities and we divided them in, I divided them into two groupings. One set of cities, roughly um, 10, have high sensitivity of housing supply, meaning when prices rise, builders are able to build. That's in blue. So here we're thinking about cities like Cincinnati, 
Cleveland, Dallas, Houston, Portland, Pittsburgh, Minneapolis, St. Louis, Milwaukee. And in those areas, what do we see with the price to rent ratio? Yes, it does rise during the subprime boom, but it doesn't rise as much. But what about the cities where it's difficult to build? Either because they've already been built out or the zoning restrictions are very tight. As we like to say in uh, Texas, you know, we, we, we let people build. It's not the same uh, where I grew up in New York or where I once lived in Southern California near the coast. And what do we see going on with the price to rent ratios in these coastal areas? We see massive swings, uh, particularly during the subprime boom. But you'll also notice that the price to rent ratio surged in these coastal cities in the late 1980s. And for those of us who have been around enough, we remember what happened to house prices in Boston and LA in the late 1980s. There, was a, there were some regional uh, boom and busts in, in house prices that a lot of people forgot about. So what do we see? We see much more pronounced swings in areas where, there's, where, where supply cannot react. Now, supply isn't the only factor that matters when it comes to house prices. A lot of it also has to reflect job growth. And here, I have a map of the unemployment rate across the United States, color-coded by states. The dark green are states where the unemployment rate is below 4.9% in December. The areas that are in light green, between five and five and a half, uh, are shown in light green, and Florida is one of them. Flor the Florida economy has come back, as you well know. The areas in light brown are 5.5 to 7 percent, and uh, there's one state with an unemployment rate above 7 percent. What's the pattern here? You look at those green areas, what are they? Typically states where it's a farm economy, an energy economy, or where there's low regulation, Two exceptions that really stick out, three exceptions that really stick out. Uh, Virginia, well, Virginia has some low regulation, but the federal government is, is based there and that tends to stabilize unemployment rates. But you'll see Ohio. Ohio, uh, the unemployment rates come down a lot because the auto industry's come back. Pennsylvania has done a lot to improve its competitiveness uh, and manufacturing is coming back in these two states to some extent. So keep in mind the job picture. Now let's dig a little deeper into some of the metro areas, if we could. Let's take a look at the Housing Opportunity or Affordability Index by metro area. And so if you go to, um, if, you, if you type in Housing Opportunity Index, you can get the metro level data from Wells Fargo and the National Association of Home Builders. Let's roll back the clock to the first quarter of 2000. What do we see? 63% of the homes sold in that quarter were affordable to the median income U.S. family. Once again, a 28%. Basically, people, what percent of, what percent of homes could a median income family buy without spending more than 28% of its monthly income? Then they take the median income by metro area. So we're, we're, this reflects that incomes are typically higher in some of the high cost areas. 40% of the homes were affordable to a median income Los Angelino family. The Pacific and Atlantic coastal metros are shown in blue. Non-Atlantic southern metros are shown in brown. And you could see that affordability is much higher in Atlanta, Dallas, Houston. What happens by 2006 Q4? Affordability plunges in the US. I showed you that chart before. But take a look at what happens in these coastal metros. 2% of the homes sold in Los Angeles at year-end 2006 were affordable to the median income Los Angelino household based on that metric. The only way that they could buy a house is if they got a non-prime, probably an Alt-A or a subprime mortgage. 2%, that is not a typo. 2%. If that isn't a bubble, I don't know what is. And by the way, 2% is below the popularity of cockroaches, Kim Jong-un, and a lot of public, public figures. What about the southern metros? 
You really didn't see much going on there. Part of the reason? Construction. By 2014, affordability has come back in the nation. It's bounced back a little bit in these metro areas along the coasts. Uh, came back, you know, it's been relatively stable in the non-Atlantic region. But affordability is not the only metric. The dynamism of a city also matters. Let's take a look at how did affordability improve? Well, in several of these cities, it was because house prices collapsed, particularly in Los Angeles and New York. What about the other areas? The more affordable metros you didn't see is sharp declines, and you actually saw some pretty sizable increases. What's different? Let's take a look at the unemployment rate in mid-2014. What do we look at, what do we see within these high-cost areas? You see that the price declines were sharpest in LA and New York, but they were not, they were not price declines, they were actually price increases in San Francisco. Look at the unemployment rates. What's going on? Silicon Valley takes off. The nerds are moving from Silicon Valley to San Francisco. They want to get a life. Sheldon Cooper, Leonard Hofstadter, and the whole Big Bang Theory gang, they're moving to the, they're moving to the big city. They're getting a little tired of living. Uh, well, actually, they're in Pasadena, but, but you get the picture. What about the southern metros? Big difference between Atlanta and the two oil boom cities of Dallas and Houston. Okay. Um, Atlanta has seen some more job growth lately, and their unemployment rate is coming down, which is good news. But Dallas and Houston in mid-2014 were doing notably better, partly because of an energy boom and partly because uh, there's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of tech stuff that goes on in Texas. It's not just a bunch, of, a bunch of oil drilling. By the way, Texas Instruments was created because you needed computer technology to be able to do the seismic exploration to do, to do drilling right. So the point here is that it's not just affordability, it's also the dynamism of a city that matters. What's next? Well, one of the things that's happened in recent years that has restrained construction is that regulations are much tougher on banks to make construction and land development loans. You gotta clear the land, put in the utilities, put in the roads before you can put up the, here's a building lot. That has limited construction and actually uh, led to some lot shortages in parts of the country. We also see some worker shortages. Home buyers are facing tougher credit standards. And that, to some extent, that's justifiable. We want some credit worthiness. But some of it was unnecessary from, ex from increased regulation. Dodd-Frank has created a lot of extra paperwork and hurdles. Uh, now, one of the problems uh, that Dodd-Frank did pose was that it was passed in the summer of 2010. And it's a thick document. And I don't think anybody in this room has probably read it from cover to cover. If you have, God bless you. Um, but the regulation said, the regulators shall create all these regulations and write them. Well, three years after Dodd-Frank was passed, roughly speaking, of only about half of those regulations were written. Meaning that if you were a banker and you were thinking about making a loan, you didn't really know what the rules of the road were. So that slowed us down. But the good news is a lot of those regs have not least now been written. And yes, the, the, mortgage, the new mortgage rules, uh, rules are quite tough, but now we're getting a lot of uh, tech-savvy firms automating a lot of that stuff, and we're starting to see uh, lending pick up a little bit. Uh, but there's also, looking ahead, some uncertainty from reforming Fannie and Freddie, and uh, it's, it's tougher for parents to borrow against their houses to put their kids through college, and the kids are basically getting a lot of student loan debt. So that's the finance side. But there's also some stuff that's going on with unusual living and labor conditions. And let me talk to you a little bit about that. We had a weak labor recovery, at least through 2013. Last year, we started to see a pickup in the job market. Okay? But weak labor recovery delays household formation, particularly among the young. We're seeing more boomerang kids moving in with mom and dad. Later marriage, lower birth rate. It's limiting the numbers of new renters and homeowners. Let's take a look at household formation. The blue line is the household formation rate among those aged 24 to 30, 25 to 34. You see that it rises 
a little bit during the subprime era, comes down during the crash. It's starting to come back a little bit. This is 25 to 34. The red line is what share of adults live with their parents. It has been shifting up over time. People talked about the boomerang kids in the 1980s, but you also see this rate go up. The, by the way, the urban economists refer to this as the co-residency rate. We parents refer to it as purgatory. Now, what is going on? Some people might say, oh, the kids are moving in with mom and dad and they're saving for a down payment. I looked at that effect. Uh, unfortunately, that's only a small part. What's really going on? Poverty, low income growth. This is one manifestation of what uh, John Doggett was talking about before, which is we don't have, the, a lot of our young people don't have good skills in the job market. There's some family uh, pattern issues as well. And what happens? The uh, poverty rate among the under age 64 has been shifting up. This is not all cyclical. Some of it is, but a lot of it is not. What's going on? They're not earning enough to pay the rent. It's not so much that the rent is, is high. It's more that the income growth has been very bad among uh, the low end of, of, of the labor market, low skill end of the labor market. And that means there's, you know, to some extent, some of these people, if, if we don't reverse this, some of these people are going to be permanently living with their parents. Uh, that impairs household formation and mental health. Now, let's talk about some other, um, sorry, other things that are going on. Uh, we've also had weak job and income growth through 2013. We've had the high student debt and tight credit standards. And this has limited home ownership. This is the home ownership rate for the whole population. You could see it rises from around 64%. It goes up to around 69%. It's back to where it was before the subprime boom. Let's take a look at the age 35 to 44 group. It rises a lot and it's plunged. Many of us older folk in the room, and I count myself among them, we didn't really suffer as much as the young people did, but the young middle-aged folks took some big hits on income, and their home ownership rate is down. On another axis, I've got the under age 35. These are the two primary age cohorts that enter the housing market. And by the way, the scales are different, but the ranges are 12 percentage points. So this is not chicanery going on here. I'm not lying with statistics. So what have we seen in terms of how does this fit the big picture? Here are single family permits. They've fallen a lot. They haven't recovered as much as we would like. But look at multifamily. Multifamilies come back. There's been a shift from owning to renting. Okay. Multifamily is pretty much back to where it was prior to the recession. The home ownership rate has fallen. Um, multifamily is probably, you know, both of these are probably going to pick up in coming years. And there's total permits. And this is the overall picture. This is total residential construction in blue. This is the dollar. This is inflation adjusted dollars. The red is overall permits, multifamily and single family. Now, what, we, what can we see going ahead? The labor market, I think, is going to be very critical. It's more critical, I think, going ahead than it's been in a long time for two reasons. One, if we're going to lower, if we're going to raise the household formation rate and get kids to move out of mom and dad. I love my oldest son, but he does need to move out. <laughs> He's a teacher, and teachers don't make too much. But he is paying off his car, so I, I should be grateful. Uh, but. If, in, if the labor market picks up, and it has, the jobs typically move first, and with a lag, the incomes rise, particularly when you're young, because you're entering the job market and you're, and you're gaining skills. But it will also help people who are renters, when their incomes improve, that they will be able to qualify for mortgages. It used to be that the main constraint in buying a house before the subprime boom was the down payment constraint. Now, 
with all the regulations, the debt service burden matters a lot more too. And debt service burden matters a lot more, not only because of the regulations, but because of also student loan debt. So let me just briefly end by talking about some other aspects of what's, what could be affecting the housing recovery. Uh, unless you live under a rock, you've noticed that oil prices and gasoline prices have, have basically uh, collapsed since uh, the summer of 2014. This is going to have a um, macroeconomic effect on the national economy. We're going to probably see uh, faster, faster GDP growth and slower the lower inflation, at least for a little while. But when we look across the states, what's going to happen? The job growth is going to shift to the coasts and to the Midwest and to the Middle South. The energy states are probably going to decelerate either toward the national average in terms of job growth or below. Um, Another thing to keep in mind is that the fallen home ownership rate that we have seen is likely going to be with us for a while. The millennials will need to rebuild, will need to re, you know, regain the income path that they probably uh, could expect in the long run. It's going to take a while. And, that, and that, how long that takes could affect the home ownership rate. Poor income growth is also a, a big factor, and that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, what happens in a recovery is right now incomes are actually rising because people are working more. Okay? Uh, but we also need to raise the wage growth in the long run. And the only way to sustainably raise the wage growth in the long run is to raise the productivity of the American workers so companies can afford to pay them more. They'll gladly pay them more if they could produce more. Okay? One final thing I do think is important is we've had an exceptionally low interest rate environment. Many people have refinanced their mortgages at very, very low interest rates. The paperwork is quite rough. Okay. Uh, my spouse and I, for example, we refinanced our mortgage about two years ago. Um, it was uh, quite different than the uh, refinancings that most of us experienced in earlier cycles. Personally, I think I'd rather get a root canal. But what, what's the case? Many of us have very low mortgage rates, 3 and 4% mortgages. And when the economy picks up even more in coming years, and when interest rates uh, start the normalization process, a lot of us are going to have the incentive to stay. There's going to be a lock-in effect. Turnover, we're not going to be uh, trading up. We're going to be fixing up. Because if you sell your house, you lose your mortgage. Uh, finally, the housing stock's a bit old. We're probably going to see a big step up in improvements. How can you fund the improvements? Cash out refinancings are tougher to do. It's going to probably be through uh, home equity lines um, more than cash out refis. So we're experiencing some tough weather outside of Florida. It's probably going to slow things down temporarily, but we're going to pick up. The uncertainty about the recovery is more about the pace not about the sustainability. And it centers on what's going to happen with credit standards and regulations, what's going to happen with mortgage rates, but also what's going to happen with the evolving patterns, living patterns of young adults. And by the way, there are these TV shows where people are buying these micro houses, building them out in the woods. Hopefully they're not building next to Ted Kaczynski. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is with the labor markets, it's not just the jobs, it's also the income. And we do need to raise the skill level of our workforce to be able to give people better jobs. But on a bright note, the recent pickup that we've seen in job growth and the broadening of the economic recovery across different sectors and different regions, I think is encouraging for housing and the overall economy. And on that happy note, thank you very much.